ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ವಾರ್ಮ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಐ ಎಂ ಮನು ಕಶ್ಯಪ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿ ಲೆಟ್ ಎಸ್ ಬಿಗಿನ್ ವಿತ್ ಅ ಸ್ಮಾಲ್ ಪ್ರೇಯರ್ ಶ್ರುತಿ ಸ್ಮೃತಿ ಪುರಾಣ ಆಲಯ ಕರುಣಾಲಯ ನಮಿ ಭಗವತ್ ಪಾದ ಶಂಕರ ಲೋಕಶಂಕರ ಸರ್ವಾತ್ಮ ಸರ್ವದೃಗ್ಯೋಸೌ ಸರ್ವಾಧ್ಯಾಸ ನಿರಾಸಕೃತ್ ಸತತ ಸನ್ನಿಧತ್ತ ಮೇ ಹೃದ ಪರಮ ಶಿವ ಐ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ ಟು ಡೇ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಆಫ್ ಗ್ಲೋಬಲ್ ಫೆಸ್ಟಿವಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಒನ್ನೆಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಗೆಸ್ಟ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣನ್ ಸುಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ್ಯನ್ ಜಿ ಹೂ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಸ್ಪೀಕಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಸಿಗ್ನಿಫಿಕೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ವೇದಾಂತ ಇನ್ ಡೈಲಿ ಲೈಫ್ ವಿ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಯು ಕೃಷ್ಣನ್ ಜಿ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಫಾರ್ ಜಾಯ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಅಸ್ ಟುಡೇ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಬೆನಿಫಿಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಅವರ್ ವ್ಯೂವರ್ಸ್ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣನ್ ಜಿ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣನ್ ಸುಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ್ಯನ್ ಜಿ ವಾಸ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಟು ಅದ್ವೈತ ವೇದಾಂತ ಇನ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಥರ್ಟೀನ್ ಥ್ರೂ ಅ ಫಾರ್ಮಲ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಬೇಸ್ಡ್ ಆನ್ ಭಗವತ್ ಗೀತಾ ಅಂಡರ್ ದ ಗೈಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಆರ್ ಎಸ್ ರವಿ ಇನ್ ಸಿಂಗಾಪುರ್ ದ ಮೆಥಡಾಲಜಿ ಆಫ್ ಲರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಇಸ್ ಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟ್ಲಿ ಗೈಡೆಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಬೇಸ್ಡ್ ಅಪಾನ್ ದ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನಲ್ ಮೆಥಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಟೀಚಿಂಗ್ ದಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಬಿನ್ ಪುಟ್ ಇನ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಬೈ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಪರಮಾರ್ಥಾನಂದ ಜಿ ಆಫ್ ಚೆನ್ನೈ ದೋ ಕೃಷ್ಣನ್ ಜಿ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಬೀನ್ ಇನ್ವಾಲ್ವ್ ಇನ್ ವೇರಿಯಸ್ ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಸರ್ವಿಸಸ್ ಆಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಆಸ್ ರಿಲಿಜಿಯಸ್ ಆಕ್ಟಿವಿಟೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ಸಿಂಗಾಪುರ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ದ ಮಿಡ್ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ನೈನ್ಟೀಸ್ his involvement in spirituality has only strengthened his commitment towards these activities he he is also teaching bhagavad gita in the same parampara style to a set of spiritual speakers in singapore krishnan ji is an engineer by profession with a degrees from iit madras and university of texas at austin he is currently a vice president in r&d at micron technology singapore krishnan ji thank you for accepting our invitation and joining us today Uh, viewers if you have any question please post them in q and a box krishnan ji will be taking up towards the end of the session krishnan ji please start your session hari om sada shiva samarambham shankaracharya madhyamam asmadacharya paryantam vande guru paramparam guru brahma guru vishnu guru devo maheshwara guru sakshat par brahma tasmay shri gurave namaha hari om all <coughs> pranams to the lord pranams to all the mahatmas and gurujis and to you all in the audience today it's my great honor and also a very humbling experience to be able to present and share a few thoughts with this very informed audience during this month of celebration of the festival of oneness as part of shankara jayanti shat celebrations this is my first time with uh, advaita academy and i've been very very enlightened listening to very few great uh, speakers over the past few weeks also and highly inspired by those two i am a very recent entrant into the spirituality sphere uh, but i can definitely say it has made a tremendous impact on my life both on the professional as well as the personal front and would like to share some of those nuggets with you all uh, as you can uh, he- as you heard from the introduction i am an engineer and scientist uh, in uh, research and development and uh, i have found that vedanta has served to only complement my scientific thinking it's not been really against my scientific thinking and no way impeded my work which is pretty much dealing with all the objective sciences as you all know uh, vedanta deals with the subjective uh, sciences or subjective reality sub the subject itself and uh, science is all about the objective reality and they are not in uh, conflict with each other and they are actually complementary and uh, we have also heard that many quantum physicists like uh, einstein have always been big followers of vedanta too so that's uh, uh, that's i would just kind of set that stage from that perspective uh, delving into the title of to my today's talk about the significance of vedanta in daily life uh, i would say the natural question that comes up to everyone's mind at this point is hey, i'm dealing with so many situations at home i'm dealing with situations at the office with so many people my spouse children my boss so many objects i'm handling my car my computer ipad all kinds of stuff and consumed by all the challenges they propose and how is it possible this this vedanta which is essentially the antim bhaga of the vedas dealing in self inquiry how can this help me with these problems after all these problems seem to be all in the world is it possible so let's take today's example and we look at the current covid situation some people are really stressed by the covid situation some people really aren't even though the covid problem is the same and it's a problem that we really need to come to terms with but some people handle it different ways now what does that mean so that means that we need to know that it's all in the mind we need to know how to handle the mind 
and lead a stressless life if you're able to deal with this in the mind. While we deal with the rest of the world, we are not going to run away from the world. While we deal with the world, how can we still live a stressless life full of uh, peace and happiness? That's the key. And if someone told you this is possible, won't you be interested? Of course. Yes, I will definitely be interested. Anyone would be interested, right? This is like having a shock absorber when you're driving a car over a bumpy road and somebody tells you, hey, there's a great shock absorber. Of course, you may not be able to fix the bumpy roads, but don't you want the shock absorber? Of course, we do want it, right? Now, at this point, the scriptures say that, okay, it's all about the mind. So the ultimate victory for the self is what? It's a self-mastery over our mind. That's what it says. That's why we celebrate Vijay Dasami at the end of the nine days of the Navaratri. It is a, it is a, it is a victory. It's an internal victory. It's the self-mastery victory, winning over all the emotional issues that are afflicting us all the time. And what are the typical emotional issues we talk about in Vedanta is the, what you call the tapatraya which is that three types of difficulties that faces. Adhyatmika, that, that means that comes from my body. Adi Bhautika, that comes from the uh, environment. And Adi Daivikam, that comes from the different forces, right? It can be the rain. So I want to come to the stock. Suddenly, maybe the uh, rain comes or some other things come and I'm not able to uh, do what I want to do. So all these various things are throwing uh, hurdles at us. And if I'm able to overcome that, that is the, that's the victory in the mind. And the world will continue to see problems. That means the world, which uh, in our class, we always call it a situation, objects, and people, will continue to throw problems at us all the time. Vedanta does not make these problems go away. But these problems, if you have the exposure to Vedanta, these problems start seeming to be trivial. Classic example of this is when the sun is shining, the stars seem to disappear. The stars are still there. We all know science says the stars don't go anywhere. But because of the power of the sun, the stars seem to disappear. So that's how, that's how you can look at the fact problems don't go away, but they look trivial. Now, does this mean we don't need to go to all the worldly things or know about the worldly things that are happening around us? There's news, that's sports, all kinds of stuff that's going on. No, it, it means that we realize that there's a rightful place for all, the, all of them in the grand scheme of things. Now, we don't have to run away from those. And this is what we mean by living an alert life or some of us uh, call it a meaningful life, right? And Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita in verse 245, Veda, uh, He says, uh, means living an alert life. And is this applicable to only family or personal life? Obviously, answer is, is applicable to both, right? Now, can I create a space? Now, we just talked about the fact that it's all in the mind. So can I create a space between myself and my mind so that I can have an alert life, right? I must, why do I, why is it so difficult to do? Because I usually assume that I'm my mind itself, right? But sometimes we say my mind, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling happy. Sometimes we do know that I'm different from the mind. So big question is, can we start creating a space between ourselves and the mind? So this is what uh, alert living is all about. And actually, many people do it, right? French Open is going on. What does the French Open, what does Nadal or, or Federer do? He creates a space between himself and the mind. So the, when the ball leaves the racket of the opponent, he's, as soon as it leaves, he's already planning his shot and executes the shot to the best of his ability. Some people call this as neighborization of the problem. And why do we call neighborization? Because we are very objective when it comes to our neighbor's problem. Only when it comes to our problem, we have all these subjectivities that are hitting us. We are not able to make good decisions. So neighborizing the problem. So these are different ways of looking at creating a space between me and my mind. So the scriptures say now that we understand all this, the problem is within us and the solution also is within us. If I understand this, I can make this learning a part of my life, both professional as well as uh, personal life. And the scriptural learning essentially helps to exercise my intellect on a sustained basis and builds the mind, the muscle in the intellect and the mind, right? It's like going to a gym. If I want to build my biceps, I just exercise the biceps. If I want to build my mind, I need to exercise my mind. Let the mind focus on not what looks impulsive, not pleasant today, which can be a poison in the future, but what is most important. And the scriptures call it, what is good for me long-term is shreyas and what is good for me Short term is prayer. So if I can get my mind to focus on what is shreyas and prayers, this is a Viveka Buddhi call, call, call. 
and then we'll be able to focus more of our effort on the shreyas. Now, next question that arises, uh, definitely came to me and I'm sure it comes to all of you, is if it's this easy, if this all looks very logical. And to me as an engineer, I find this logic very, very convincing and, uh, and uh, comfortable to be uh, in terms with, and that's why I'm able to appreciate it. Now, if that's simple, everyone should be in this path. Why is it not possible? And this is what I'm going to spend more, more, most of my talk today. Scriptures give two big reasons for this. So one is the fact that in the millions of janmas we have taken, of course, another dharma has, has clearly laid out that we have uh, cycles of birth and rebirth, right? And the millions of janma we have taken, which sometimes uh, some of the scriptures say is equivalent to the grains of sand. I think it's Vivek Chodamani that says that that many millions of janmas you have taken, we are carrying a bundle of past karmas. And the karma theory will talk about praradha karma, sanchita karma, and agami karma. These are all like bank balance of papa punya that we carry. And they fructify at different times. We don't know when they fructify. They're not necessarily first in, first out. And when we when these fructify, and when the good karma fructifies, we become we part of a satsang, and we are on this path. Or for that matter, those of you who are participating in this talk today, I can say, some good karma of yours is fructified and you start spending a Saturday evening doing some other pursuits outside, you are spending the time in this talk. So it, that's, the one of, that's what our scriptures say. And for me, myself, I can say that I didn't come to this path by accident. There were a lot of times in, the, in 15, 20 years before this, there were Vedantin friends of mine who were trying to get me to this path. I just couldn't. So it's not that I was not exposed to it, but some prarabdha fructified in 2013 and got into this path. Similarly, scriptures also say the same kind of prarabdha, if it is working against you, maybe we are a lot of papa punya, so a lot of papa karma, and that is, which is working against you, this is start throwing mental challenges in the form of doubts and myths, and this we call as vasanas, or habits that we collect, asanas or impressions we collect from our previous birth. Such doubts and myths will essentially keep us away from this knowledge. And this is what I'm going to deal with today to talk about top to six to seven myths and how systematically removing these myths, we can see, we we'll start seeing the relevance of Vedanta in our daily life. If you don't remove these myths, Vedanta just remains a intellectual learning. And this very happens very, very gradually for most of us. And the primary scripture that has enabled that for me and for most people who are at the, at the starting steps of Vedanta is the Bhagavad Gita. And the Dhyana Shlokas Bhagavad Gita say, Sarvopanishodho Gavo, Dogda Gopal Nandraha. That means it is a saram, saram of all the Upanishads. And if, it's, if there is one scripture you want to spend all your time and do it multiple times, is Bhagavad Gita. Right? So essentially, that uh, if, I, if, I, if Bhagavad Gita was able to help me break some of my myths and be able to appreciate these values, and that takes me. Uh, uh, to be able to use Vedanta in my daily life uh, more effectively. So in this talk, I will be going uh, through different myths uh, and I will also be going through things I have done, things I have been trying and things I think I need to try. So uh, please be aware of this. Some things I talk about, not necessarily all of them I have been successful at. So it will be a mixture of uh, these various facets. So let's start from the very beginning. Myth number one. Myth number one is, Vedanta is for older people at 60 or 70 or hence for post-retirement. Now, looking at the introduction that I gave in the, uh, in the last uh, 15 minutes, it's very obvious if the, if the benefit is for me here and now, I would want to have it right now. Why, why would I wait until 70? So again, somebody has to tell you the benefit. Now, there are a few classic examples that we can use in our own life. Actually, we do these things in our material life. So we take health insurance for a future health issue, right? The health issue may happen 20 years, 30 years from now, but we take health insurance. Now for a future emotional issue, we don't take any insurance, right? Now this is the insurance that, that you take for emotional issue. We only take it for our body, stula shariram only. This is for our sukshma shariram or the mind. Our Swamiji, Swami Paramarthananda ji calls it UPS or uninterrupted pleasure supply. If you're able to get to this, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, concept of peace, security, and happiness, and this knowledge, essentially, we are able to get to this uninterrupted pleasure supply. Now, if I know this, I would obviously take it, right? 
but most of us don't know it because this this uh, jnanam we are not exposed to uh, the satsangs and the learned people for the reasons i mentioned earlier another example you can think of this uh, 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 at why people don't come to this is it's like a may help you line at an airport right if you are lost we would want to take help from it we shouldn't be worried about our pride so please think about this we do that when we really need help if you don't take the help from the may I help you line keep going around you know what's the consequence so so having said that that it's not for only for all people so I mean, there are a few quotes i would like to uh, stress on what many of the swamiji's have said swami chinmayananda used to say that he wanted to see a lot of youth coming to his jnana uh, yagya uh, and he used to uh, um, kind of uh, jovially say that he sees a lot of muffler totting old people comes to those yagnas but he wanted to see a lot of people the youth to come because logically if the exposure is gotten early in your life you have many many more years to internalize and put this thing to use uh, if you go by what we have just discussed earlier vajagovindam says balastavad kriḍa saktah tarunastavad taruni saktah vṛddhastavad cinta shaktah parame brahmani kopina saktah what does that mean balastavad in the small age kriḍa i am always playing tarunastavad some of the guruji say with a lot of uh, in a very lighter vein girlfriend boyfriend saktah that means i am in a, in my teens and youth then i am going to vṛddhastavad i mean always worrying that whatever i have is going to go away etc etc my health so on and so forth and all this i have no time for brahma vich uh, brahma vicharam at all so essentially i don't know that i need to do this and i am not exposing myself to this learning at all okay now what is it what is in it for me if i if you tell me all these things all these things sounds like a good consultant but what's in it for me the pro- what is in it for me very simple i am going through samsara problem every day which reach that means i'm facing eternal challenges we just talked about earlier at the physical level mental level intellectual level all these things i'm going to go through i'm going through all the time and if i need to have a good way of how to understand the problem statement i need to understand the road map where am i how do i get there the scriptures give me that so that is the main gain if i come to it early i will it will tell me where am i and how should i get to the end state it will tell me how, how i should look at the purusharthas the four purusharthas that we know artha kama dharma and moksha so it will tell you what are all the different things you have to do how do you approach life what is aware living what is uh, atma van bhava and it tells you that i have to work on the prayatna for chitta shuddhi that means cleaning up my mind chitta ekagrata stabilizing my mind then go to jnana vichara it will tell me all these things in different steps of course even if before you go there it will tell me how to lead a dharmic life of artha and kama because we want to enjoy earn earn wealth all that is no problem but under the uh, umbrella of dharma and another way of looking at this is why should i need this right you ask very simple example for us is if you buy a phone from the market it comes with the user manual and i better you know how to use the user manual so that i can use the device to its best and we as humans if we have been created by the creator there is a there is a manual that and that manual is the vedas so if you don't use the manual and just use the uh, life that's given to us in any random fashion we know where we end up we don't we don't follow what's given in the user's manual so i hope i have convinced you to this point that the time is now it is not 60 it is not 70 it is not youth the time is now and if you are if you're already on the on the path the time is for you to hit the accelerator pedal right this is just like a golf game you are only playing against yourself so don't worry about your opponent or any of those things you are just trying to better yourself so that's myth number 1 i'll go to myth number 2 the myth number 2 as so i'm going in a sort of increasing order of the difficulty of the myths the next myth is that going to spirituality means sanyasa only that means sanyasa means life of a monk a celibate monk i mean i mean uh, saffron clothes etc etc and i should not possess anything i should be hating any kind of wealth what scriptures clearly say that sanyasa is not external but internal sanyasa this is the focus of chapter 4 and 5 of the gita and bit in chapter 3 also now chapter 4 and 5 clearly explain in multiple verses and i won't read the whole verse in the interest of time uh, you can go and refer uh, 
verse 3 of chapter 5 nesya nitya sanyasi if you read through that verse it clearly says that yona dveshina kankshati it is saying the person who is not who doesn't have dvesha who doesn't have too much expectations that is the one we call a sanyasi right now why is this explaining this way because our typical uh, uh, picture that we have in a sanyasi is i would like to go if this is what the path you tell me i want to go sit in a corner in a cave and i want to just sit in a uh, and and maybe meditate right and inaction is sometimes equated to this and scriptures clearly say in chapter 3 also nahi kashchit shanam api chatu tishtate akarma krute that means there is no chance for inaction at all because our mind is not trained and if you happen to go do or do that and run away to the himalayas you will end up becoming mithyachara this is what chapter 3 says right mithyachara means hypocrite if you haven't trained your mind and just try to run away from the life and try to think you can be a life of inaction uh, that is not possible so because first you have to train your mind and scriptures also say or gita says in uh, chapter 5 6 shloka that sanyasa is extremely difficult it says this to arjuna arjuna wants to run away from the war and bhagavan is trying to convince him to still fight because that is his uh, swakarma that is his uh, uh, kshatriya karma and kshatriya dharma he has to do it and he says you you cannot run away so for us and he says uh, sanyasa ashrama is extremely difficult so shreyas grahastha which is the same lesson applicable to us now this is a very important uh, myth to debunk because we get trapped in all this sanyasa and we try to stay away from from gita itself now then you would ask at this point what is internal sanyasa okay you have told me it's not external sanyasa it is not kashayam it is not saffron but what is internal sanyasa now this is where scriptures talk about karma yoga in the uh, gita talks about karma yoga in the first part portion of the gita we won't spend talking about karma yoga but i'll give a very high level uh, introduction those of you who are familiar i'm sure you can associate yourself to the key verses uh, that talk about this but in very very high level language it's a life of contribution scriptures call it pancha maha yagna that means deva yagna the forces the devas rishi yagna all the rishis uh, contributions to the rishis contributions to the pitrus contribution manushya all the fellow beings social service all those things bhuta yagna which is the the plants and the animal kingdom so all the ec- ecological balance you're talking about today is already addressed in the pancha maha yagna so that is number one feature of uh, karma yoga and this is all again connecting back to internal sanyasa that means how should i lead lead a life of uh, internal renunci- that means internal renunciation then i do everything as ishara prasada buddhi that means i have a graceful acceptance of what life offers not murmuring and grumbling but very graceful acceptance then i do everything with the ishara arpana buddhi that means i dedicate actions to the lord try to reduce my or eliminate my doership i want to continue to do all my best but i don't want to be always thinking of me 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 all the time so i want to reduce the doership almost like i'm a trustee even a company i'm doing it for the boss or i'm doing it for the company or if it is in life i am doing it for the lord so i am becoming a more a, a contributor than trying to be a controller now all this says i still need to continue to act that's why earlier i said inaction is not absolutely possible so inaction is not recommended at all i have to continue to do what i have to do in my life if i am a father i have the job of father if i am a, a boss at work i have that role if i have a husband i have a different role wife etc i have to continue to do my work next question that again is a myth this oh this internal sanyasi still has these myths in our mind that he should have no possessions that means must be always getting away from wealth may should not be driving a car some of us think you should have a big beard you should be wearing uh, maybe wooden slippers or any of those things do i need to do all that that's what keeps me away from this of course not answer is of course not train yourself to be an internal sanyasa what does that mean simplest way to think about this on top of karma yoga is can we start converting our needs to preferences very simple way of do, uh, thinking about this this is our swami ji's uh, favorite term and this is a training on vairagyam where i continue to enjoy things that i am i am blessed with but i am not emotionally dependent on them that they are all preferences but they are not needs it's not like i will have a major emotional outburst if i don't have my coffee or tea or something of that sort next morning right i need to have be able to convert the needs to preferences of course i need wealth to run my family 
to to uh, to get my kids to education etc etc so i respect lakshmi so i do lakshmi puja it is not like a internal sanyasi will not respect the wealth at all but we will train to convert the needs to preferences now train yourself to enjoy this world knowing that it is not permanent anything that comes with uh, to us that will always go away we know that in vedanta right mahakuru dhanajana yavvana garvam harati nimesha kalat sarvam se sadhi shankara in bhagavad gita in just like a minute it could be gone right which what can be gone uh, kuru dhana that means wealth janam people yavvanam youth all this could be gone now you would ask okay all this sounds very very nice on a saturday evening is it even possible actually we do it when we go on vacation we know that the vacation is going to end in a week yet we enjoy it so we know how to enjoy things that i have limited lifetime it's not a problem this is all a matter of training our mind again back to mind training now from here i'll go to myth number 3 again higher level myth myth number 3 is shraddha big obstacle biggest obstacle because to us shraddha means blind faith or those of us who have understood shraddha it looks as blind faith and hey i am a rational guy i am an engineer i am a scientist i am whatever i am a rational guy i don't believe in all these things right? that's our first approach to uh, anything that comes to us where we are asked to have shraddha now contrary to popular understanding sanatana dharma is a philosophy based system and not a belief based system a lot of us don't know this we think it is belief actually it is not it is a philosophy based system now what do i mean by that that means that it's a philosophy that is given and once you learn the philosophy you you have believed to learn the philosophy but once you have internalized the philosophy you can forget the belief you don't need the belief you the, the philo- you have learned it enough so that's why we don't use the word preaching in any of our discussions we use the word teaching and it's a very big difference between preaching and teaching so scriptures say that this philosophy which is the shruti or the vedas is the philosophy and this is this is a sixth pramanam what is sixth pramanam sixth source of knowledge it cannot be verified with our five sense organs our five sense organs that we know are operating in their own fields in fact each of our sense organs cannot operate in the field of the other seven sense organ what i can see the ear is not able to see that right now this is the shruti or the vedas is the sixth pramanam whatever the veda says these sense organs cannot verify so if he talks about swarga it talks about rebirth the sense organs are not able to verify this is what we call as astike buddhi that means we take this then we use our logic to go and validate it that means uh, as i said it doesn't mean this is against logic so we need that initial uh, belief to take the learning open mind then use our logic to validate use our life experience to further validate it and this is what the scriptures call shruti yukti and anubhava that means you start with the learning then use your logic to uh, clarify and then anubhava in your life you can see that these actually make sense but you need to give it that much of time if you are impatient it it will not make any difference to you so this learning of the shruti removes its defect of ignorance because essentially it's knowledge that removes ignorance yukti as you start reasoning it it will remove the defect of samshayam which is the doubts and then the anubhava which basically helps you internalize it which uh, with in scriptures we call it nididhyasana so you can look at this as parallels and essentially this will help you internalize internalize this knowledge now okay this all makes sense but immediately we come back to say you know no no that's not possible logical question is i only believe what i see how can i i can i take all these things because i i only believe believe what i see with my own eyes really please ask yourself this question right do you always see everything that uh, everything that you believe do you see okay we get into a plane of course we don't get into planes these days much with uh, with covid but we do get into planes and do we know the pilot is well rested do we know his uh, his uh, a license has been renewed do you know he's stressed out on the previous evening do you know all these things no you can't see any of these things but somehow you believe so we do run our life on belief it's not that we have to see everything right to me i am in the in my job i'm a semiconductor physics engineer i deal with electrons and and all, all kinds of particles which i don't see but i understand and appreciate their manifestation all the time that's how i can do my job so it's not that you need to see everything 
right? We take it, we validate it. In a math class, if you take a Pythagoras theorem, it's not that we, every time, once the Pythagoras theorem is given, I understand it. I take it, draw for myself, validate it, and I say, oh, I understand it. The Shraddha is exactly the same thing, right? The more we listen, more open our mind becomes, we're able to accept it, start validating, then we listen more, listen to more the Mahatma, so drill the same message into you. That's how our Shraddha improves. A famous uh, Subhashitam comes very handy here. It says, Mantre, Tirte, Dvije, Deve, Devagne, Beshaje, Gurau, Yadrishi, Bhavana, Yasya Siddhir, Bhavati, Tadrishi. Now, what does this mean? Sounds like a very uh, complicated Subhashitam, but it's very simple. Mantre, Mantram, uh, we know what mantras are. Tirte, Tirta Yatra, Dvije, uh, uh, a Brahmana, a learned person. Deve, the uh, uh, Devagne is the uh, Beshaji is a doctor, guru, and uh, Devagnya is the uh, astrologer. All these devas, uh, deves, devas, all these people, you have to first believe. It's almost like a doc Beshaji is a doctor. I and mean, this is a very classical example for us. If you don't believe what the doctor says, what do you do? I go for second consultation. I don't believe the second doctor, I could go for a third. It never ends, right? So you have to put your faith in the, in the doctor's hands. So efficacy of our treatment is directly proportional to the faith we put in that person. So same thing on the scriptures also. If I want more benefit on efficacy, I need to put in the faith. So part of our training in, is to be able to put this, uh, effic uh, put this Shraddha in the scriptures. So and we've also seen that if we didn't have these attributes, we'll be a doubting Thomas all our lives. And we know what happens to doubting, doubting Thomases in a, even our material lives. They actually don't go too far. So we don't need to be thinking of scriptural learning, but even for material learning. Myth number four. So we have done three myths. We go to myth number four. Once I cross these, let's say I cross these various barriers. Now I come to the next barrier. Now I'm an intellectual, or at least I think I am. I can simply read the Gita or the Upanishad, right? Now it's so easily available on the internet, books are available, etc., And I'm done. And okay. And before you get to that stage, some of us may have a myth that I may not be able to do it because I don't know Sanskrit. That's other problem. So Adi Shankara debunks this right away in the start of Bajagovindam. He says, Bajagovindam, Bajagovindam, Govindam, Bajamudamate, Samprakte, Sannihite Kale, Nahi Nahi Rakshati, Dugrin Karane. So he says, he, he actually looks at this old man who is trying to learn all the Vyakarana and the grammar in Kashi instead of trying to look for moksha. That means, you, you don't need to spend your time in Sanskrit. If your time is running out, try to get to the scriptural learning. And we don't need Sanskrit because today, uh, the great English-speaking Swamiji's, Swami Chinmayandaji, Swami Dayanandaji, Swami Paramarthanandaji, Swami Omkarandaji, all of them have brilliantly simplified all these scriptures in English and have lectures on the internet and so many uh, resources available for us. And they have even made lecture notes. Some satsangis have been making lecture notes, these are all available. So we, Sanskrit is not a prerequisite, but of course you will learn Sanskrit as you walk through these scriptures. Now, so the problem is now, okay, I don't, now I'm convinced I don't need Sanskrit, but can I just read? So coming to this path, I realized that this must be a guided journey by the guru. It cannot be, uh, it cannot be something I can read because there are a lot of seeming inconsistencies in these scriptures. So I must invest my time in with the guru, a guided journey, who takes me through Shravanam, which is listening, Mananam, which is clarifying my doubts, and Nididhyasanam, which is overcoming all my wrong tendencies or habits. So this is very important because the scriptures have many confounding or very naughty shlok uh, shlokas, K-N-O-T-T-Y, because the word Atma means different things in different places. Sometimes it's the mind, sometimes the body, sometimes it's the uh, Satchidananda Atma, so we need a guru. A live guru is very important so that we can have a conversation. Of course, if you are living in a country where you don't have the facilities, we go to the recordings. Now, then we have to think of what the guru's grace means. The guru's grace means he is not again removing your worldly problems, right? Guru is not removing your worldly problems. They will still stay. And But he shows you the shastras like a mirror, darpanam, mirror to see your higher eye, just like we use a mirror to see our stula sharidam. Without that, I cannot see myself, but the 
scriptures he shows the scriptures so i can see my higher eye the atma but at the end of the road he is just like a cheer leader we need to run the race and this is where our prayatna comes in so there are famous shubha subhashitams in the interest of time i won't go through that but it says the learning comes from the teacher it comes from myself from the satsangis around us and from our anubhava in our life so these are all different quarters of learning there are four different ways you can learn scriptures also say that don't go looking for a guru if you are ready the guru will find you uh, lord has like an academy of gurus that he will dispatch a guru when you when the right time is right then the last or the almost the last but one is okay i have come to this point of gaining knowledge i understand the knowledge is what helps me remove all my uh, problems and atma vichara is what gives me the peace security and happiness now is it all about gaining knowledge because okay you told me there is recordings available there is uh, uh, some of these transcripts available can i read those reason this myth comes is because sometimes we compare to like people like bhagavan ramana because he just sent went and sat in a cave and he said who am i and he is liberated so we think okay maybe that's all it is i just go sit in a cave who am i you can guess what will happen if you ask who am i you will still be thinking of all the various things that you are missing the movies and the restaurants etc you will not have any atma gyanam sitting in a cave now why is that why is it you told me all these things about learning but why is that because we have realized that we haven't done the sadhanas in the previous janma that ramana maharishi did and what are those sadhanas right and those sadhanas if you don't do we can't internalize the knowledge and we don't internalize this knowledge it will not come to our rescue when we need it now internalizing the session of the knowledge leads to the step that we have to really focus on which is transformation this is where most of us have a difficult time we have to convert the information into transformation information we can get through transcripts and and audios but i have to convert to transformation right i i have been told that i need to go to the gym to reduce my weight but who has to do that i have to go to the gym so i have to do my life transformation so otherwise we'll just be able to give lectures on an intellectual level but we won't be able to do any transformation self transformation is what is needed for us to internalize the knowledge simple way to think of self transformation is chitta shuddhi and chitta ekagrata that means i have to clean up my mind i have to stabilize my mind why do i need to do those two things then only i can put the knowledge what's a good analogy for this simple way to think about this is if i have to write on a board i have to clean the board first then i have to be able to stabilize the board if the board is shaking i won't be able to do anything so i have to clean the board which is chitta shuddhi i have to clean up then i have to make it stable chitta ekagrata that means stabilize it this is equal to the mind so mind i have to clean up the mind and i have to stabilize the mind various techniques are given in the scriptures which we have touched earlier also but in this context i will say that this cannot be a casual process at all so i have to develop the right uh, capabilities in my mind i have to develop good qualities in my mind which is what we call devi sampat chapter 16 of the gita talks about it i should get rid of my asuri sampat some of us think asuras and rakshasas are outside no actually they are inside our mind itself then we focus on developing the uh, vivekam vairagyam mukshutvam and samadhi shraddha sampatti which all of us know is called the sadhana chatushtaya now a practical tips in this area we can think about a few of them i will uh, i will say those few things which are my personal experience how do we develop these various uh, uh, various uh, shamaha damaha uparama shamaha is mind control damaha is sense control uparama is quietitude titiksha is forbearance shraddha we talked about samadana is samatvam equanimity equipoise we have to develop all this in our mind simple example ekadashi fasting is an austerity why do we do it i do it for titiksha or building this tolerance that it's a voluntary self denial i am not forcing myself if i do voluntary self denial it's a private victory as steven covey calls it those of you who read steven covey's seven habits i am not guilty looking for perfection here what is perfection some people tell me perfection means i should not even drink a drop of water no i am going shanai shanai little by little i am trying to build up my titiksha i am not going to compare to all the different people now of course ekadashi has been glorified by the japanese researchers who have got a nobel prize for saying ekadashi fasting actually has a humongous uh, benefit on on your health right 
Next one is moderation. Moderation is a very favorite topic in Vedanta, right? Moderation in, and I have, I, have, I have tried my hand at it, moderating the kind of movies I watch, kind of books I read, kind of friends I have, who are my closest circle. These are all very, very important. Of course, in today's context, the social media is another very big thing. So this helps in my Shama and Damaha, which is my mind and sense control. Vairagyam, we have said earlier, which is my conversion of needs to uh, preferences to needs. Uh, sorry, needs to preferences, sorry. And then the life of contribution is another big piece. And we think of life of contribution as dhanam, as material, let's say, wealth, but it can be your time, it can be your knowledge, any of those things. And in chapter 18, we say, yajna dhana tapak karma, na tejet. You can, you can never let go of this because you constantly have to be on the alert. Now, when you actually donate, and I say donate doesn't mean time, doesn't mean money only, money, time, or knowledge, who is the biggest beneficiary? Sometimes we think the person who got it is a beneficiary. Actually, once you are in this, in this journey, you realize that you are the biggest beneficiary because Chitta Shuddhi that you get, so difficult to get and you benefit so you have lost your sense of uh, ownership to it you have reduced your pride ego etc so i am the biggest beneficiary in the recent uh, example of the vaccines that uh, india uh, distributed uh, uh, freely to many of the countries uh, modi ji talked about it, our uh, honorable prime minister of india said this giving vaccine to other countries actually our dharma it is not philanthropy at all now huge difference between dharma and philanthropy Philanthropy means I give, I think I want some fame, I want some, some credit for it. Dharma means it's my job. If I have more, I will just give it to people who need it. So for us, dhanam is part of our dharma. And then uh, the last one I'll leave you with is once you realize the need for self-transformation, our commitment, my, my own commitment to my daily religious practices, be it Sandhya Vandanam, be it morning prayers, all these, it, it, I start, uh, I, I have a lot more commitment. I start my day positive. I exude a lot of positivity if I can. Uh, I try to avoid using this chalta hai word. When somebody says, how is going? Most of us try to say chalta hai. Actually, we should try to avoid using that because I should be a lot more positive if I have this, this uh, uh, knowledge clearly in my mind. The last of the myths I'm going to talk about is what the, the, uh, the biggest one is what or who is God and what is God-centered life. Now, why is this important? Now, why God is, this is very important because this is another major confusion we don't come to the scriptures. It is very liberating to understand in Sanatana Dharma that the Swarupam or the, or the form of the God evolves with our own maturity. We start with Ekarupa Ishwara, that means we say the Lord is somewhere, I am here. Then we gradually migrate to the next stage, Vishwarupa Ishwara, which we say divinize the entire world. I will not go more detail than that. But let's look at what's the benefit of divinizing the entire world from a work perspective as well as our family. Largest realization is I am part of a larger macro structure. I am not this puny individual, but I'm part of a larger structure. I, I think there are law, laws of the universe are all working fine. I go from chaos to cosmos thinking or cosmogenesis thinking. This is very important. Otherwise, we think the life is chaos and you see there is unfairness. But once you have this thinking, Cosmos, that means there are laws governing it and everything that's happening is fair. And that's how you build gratitude and you start being subtle-minded to recognize the grace of things happening around you. Great training for the children because things happen that exceed our expectations. We need to be able to understand that the laws are working in our favor sometimes. And we have to develop that gratitude so that when things go wrong, I have the emotional cushion to take it. This is really the training we need to give our kids and not about all the other uh, success because they need to how to hand they need to know how to handle success and failure great to write a gratitude diary on a daily basis how does this work at, at the office right if i know i have divinized the whole world how does it work at the workplace is it possible absolutely possible i start seeing divinity in everyone what does it mean does it mean i just rest or worship everyone no that means i start learning from everyone around me right Adi Shankara says in Manisha Panchakam that even the Chandala who comes in front of him, he is also his guru. So what is difficult to learn from all the people at the office? On Avadhuta Gita, uh, we talk about 24 different guru tattvam. So guru is not just one person. You can learn from uh, different people around you. Diversity and inclusion, which is a very important piece of uh, work culture these days. 
acquires a very different meaning from vedanta angle because everyone is a vibhuti of the lord everyone you see divinity in everyone you don't have to have a diversity and inclusion program or diversity equality inclusion it is all part of our scriptures coming down to one more level if i think i'm part of a big macroscopic structure my contrib i know that i don't control the outcome but my contributions do matter so i continue to bring my best self to work i continue to do my best very important there should be no boredom i should be in doing my best yoga karma su kaushalam in, in chapter 2 so this is very very helps us to do a extremely good job at the office so hopefully within the six myths i have given you how these myths break when the myths break how does it help you do the right things and have an incorporate vedanta in your daily life both personal and the professional front so quick recap vedanta is not for the late years it is not for the retirees it is here and now so jump on to the first step of the escalator if you are not already on the escalator right vedanta is all about sanyasa again myth is broken it does you don't have to give up your wealth you don't have to go away to the forest maybe there are not too many forest to go these days also vedanta is all about self learning and needs sanskrit so uh, that's a myth that is broken vedanta is just information and not transformation another myth and then we talked about who is god and what is the significance of understanding the vishwarupa of the lord how i can apply that to both my work as well as my family structure so in summary victory over yourself is the real victory right we have that's what i started off saying this is the real success and not what the material world really calls a success right for this we need to choose the right action do it with the right attitude and have the right values may the lord bless us to take this raja marga so i say in tyagara it says chakkani marga uh, so chakkani raja marga that means this is a royal path of the uh, royal path that we need to take and we need to figure out how to do we don't have to wait for some big project to be assigned to us we can do small things in a very great way as swami chinmayananda says says uh, in his lectures so hope some of these resonate with your own experiences and help you to continue your journey with even more vigor if you're not uh, if you've already started and if not if you haven't started just go take the plunge uh, hasten slowly again another swami chinmayananda ji's uh, words i love very much so at the conclusion i would say anything i have said that makes sense all the glories to my guru shri rs ravi and the guru parampara itself and anything uh, that did not make sense all the mistakes are completely mine thanks once again to the advaita academy for this opportunity are you uh, kristen ji thank you for breaking it down so wonderfully and it was very fascinating listening to you uh, we have 10 more minutes and are you Uh, we would like to uh, take up some questions sure. from the audience <clears throat> so the first question is how do i an unaware person who is carrying out my swadharma work towards understanding the difference between the dualism and non dualism okay if your uh, dualism non dualism is at the philosophy level the simple answer i would give is doing swadharma but how are you doing with the right attitude as i said in the end right action right attitude right values if you are able to do your swadharma with the right attitude and the right values that you spend of spend a lot of time on it then the duality and non dual all this can be kept to a, a a future problem that you can come to much later it is more important to be able to execute our actions with the right attitude and the right values thank you uh, and the next question is sir i read that i should not identify as a doer when physically i am doing each dharma then how can i just be a witness of all the actions yes that pro- proves that i am identifying myself with the body how do i detach myself from the body so i will give a brilliant i'll give an uh, excellent example i heard actually in one of these talks uh, i think sri lakshmi narayan ji i think he gave a example and i'll probably take 30 seconds to explain the story and so that you can internalize from the story so here is a king who is having a successful kingdom and he is stressed out his people are very happy he is doing a good job but he is stressed out because he has all these duties to do he goes meets a muni because somebody tells him go meet this uh, great wise man the wise man say oh really okay no problem uh, let me take a swap roles i will be- become the king and, uh, and let me see what i can do so he becomes a king and he says i am not 
trained to do your job so you become my vice president or ceo or whatever and with that the king actually can execute his job he doesn't have any problem now the king is exactly doing what he was doing before now he has he is doing it for the muni who became the king and he became a like a ceo or any of those terms you can call it so he is just converted the same job from ownership to trusteeship only the attitude changed so the non doership can easily come if you are able to change your vision of how you do things so this is to me if you internalize this example maybe we can all figure out how to do that thank you and the next question is how to set goals in worldly life and still maintain ishwara arpana buddhi okay excellent this is a really really important question because this is what we face with life all the time at the office at, at home so as i said yoga karma so kaushalam means i have to do my best so if i have to set goals for my team i absolutely have to set the the most aggressive goals for myself for my team or from my children if they have to achieve the best no there is no let up there is no uh, thing saying that i underperform but all vedanta says is don't be too emotionally attached to the success or the failure it does not say don't set tough goals but accept it as ishwar prasada which means when the prasada comes it could be a choice full situation in which case i try again choiceless situation i know how to gracefully accept if i can do that i'll continue to set tough goals so there is no reason to back away from setting tough goals at all thank you uh, i think uh, krishna knows this very well that he as <laughs> why after he said samattam yoga vichade people may be thinking i should just accept he immediately comes with yoga karma so kaushalam so that we don't have this uh, exit class for us <laughs> yes thank you and the next question is is it because of our past karm past good karmas or bad deeds that we take birth or rebirth in human form how do we explain the cycle of birth and rebirth next is uh, how do one start the how do one start to follow the path of spiritualism do one require a guru for this okay i'll go backwards because the third question is easy i already explained that in the talk uh, absolutely you need a guru because uh, the guru is the one who can show you the shastra mirror if you try to self read i have already explained so that can be answered the intermediate uh, question if you don't mind repeating uh, yes yes the sec- how do you explain the cycle of birth and rebirth cycle of birth. is it because okay. of uh, past karmas again that i i had also answered it is this shastra shraddha is a praman the fact that this is a sixth pramanam you have to first believe that my sense organs cannot uh, absolutely verify it it has to come from shastra pramanam but actually in our life you can see if there are twins who are born same day same minute same parents same genetic code they have a different life their health may be different their intellectual capability may be different and we have seen prodigies uh, that come up in music all this says that there is absolutely birth and rebirth and i use bhagwan uh, Bhag- uh, ramana maharshi's example saying that he was able to do something that all of us uh, won't be able to do the sadhana which means he has carried something from his previous birth so we cannot see birth and death cycle our intellect is not capable but we can absolutely validate that by looking at examples in this janma itself i hope that answers the question yes yes thank you the next question is uh, kindly guide us how a beginner of vedanta learning should go about it in the uh, initial stage uh, tell us what should be the ba- first baby steps we need to take as a vedanta student i think this also i probably address in the sequence of how i said it uh once uh, once you learn to be dharmic first thing is ground zero level is learn to lead a dharmic living that itself is very difficult these days because there are so many opportunities for us to go on the adharmic path so once you go live a life of dharma where you earn and enjoy uh with uh, under the under the guidance of dharma then you will realize that uh, there is a point in time where you don't get that much pleasure out of things uh, that are temporary in nature it will automatically take you uh, towards this journey and of course simplest thing is to come in the come into the company of satsangis come into the company of like minded people i think then the uh, journey if you step your foot on the escalator the journey will take you there yes uh, the next question is you said one myth is that time to start and then what is your idea or solution to begin in the impulsive stage of any being is this path of learn in this path of learning 
uh, could you repeat that what is the uh, yes, what is the what is your idea or solution to begin in this uh, impulsive state of any being what is a okay i i i'm trying to make sure i understand the question so how do you go from impulsive to deliberate action that's what i think the question is yeah. and i i i think the, the the sportsman example that i used is probably something that we can all use or somebody is playing for match point in a tennis game if their mind is focused on the cup they will probably lose their last point right so impulsive versus deliberate living is is having being able to create the gap between myself and my mind or myself and the action i am able to have a sakshi bhava i am able to create that space right then i will be less if i can watch my mind i should be able to uh, i should be able to make sure i only get good thoughts that converts to good deeds right yeah uh, we will take uh, two more quick questions sure uh, how can vedanta help in resolving interpersonal uh, conflicts between people excellent question i did answer that in an indirect way right vedanta does not fix other people's problem so at least it tells me that i should not expect other people to change or things to change because i don't like or i cannot come to terms with it it is a self journey that means i am not expecting the world to change i am not expecting covid to go away tomorrow just because i am a vedanta student right <laughs> it will take its own course but i learn to live with it and i learn to have my peace security and happiness in spite of the situation around it so if it is an interpersonal problem it is not as long as you are not trying to fix the other person and you are trying to fix yourself to be able to handle the situation that's what vedanta says yeah and the last question uh, how chanting or learning of mantras or shlokas help to follow spiritual uh, life okay we didn't touch upon it today but uh, japa uh, bhagavan in chapter 10 says ajnana japa yagnyosmi It means japa is a one of the sadhanas like as a karma yoga sadhana austerity of uh, ekadashi fasting is a sadhana japa is also sadhana which means i repeatedly chant to the s- same thing i increase my uh, focus in the mind thereby i can i can uh, give less space for unwanted thoughts to come in i start training my mind to focus on what i want so it is one of the sadhanas that we can use to train our mind that's the way to look look at japa yoga okay but n- none of this is a alternative for gnana you can do all these things but ultimately without gnana there is no moksha we didn't talk about moksha today but i i thought we we touched on enough myths that hopefully get people on the right right journey yeah definitely uh, and krishnan ji uh, thank you for uh, addressing today and answering all these questions and from the entire team of advaita academy thank you immensely for uh, joining accepting our invitation and joining <clears throat> ayyo thank yeah. you very much thank you Uh, viewers with this we conclude yet another session of global festival of oneness in the morning session tomorrow swami shuddhabodananda ji will be speaking on the topic advaita uh, shruti pramana versus anubhava pramana in advaita vedanta please tune into the session indica courses in collaboration with advaita academy brings to you a structured course to empower you with the knowledge of moksha it is taught by shri kathirasan k ji please register for this elevating experience and there is an important announcement for sadhakas and seekers indica renaissance fund is pleased to announce a scholarship scheme of 50% of the fees payable for six selected sadhakas sadhakas and seekers are encouraged to make use of this wonderful opportunity with this we conclude shri guru bhyo namaha Thank you.